coming right here. We're going to sing it through once so that we know how to stand. And then we encourage and exhort all of you to sing it with us the second time through. Right? <laughs> because we all have such wonderful pieces of Josie and when we come together there are ways in which we can build them and build some enormous mosaic and it's been happening on Facebook which of course has been great. I'm Holly Lau and I'm now Chair of Theater and Dance and some of you who were here from 1991 or between 1991 or after 1991 probably knew me as a dance professor but now I'm in theater and doing the chairmanship so that's my new role and it's been exciting I have to say. So when we got all those memories, those posts about memories of Josie on the Facebook, I have to say I was a little upset. And I was upset because I kept thinking, oh my god, that's my Josie. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized that she had this gift to walk into people's hearts and make us feel known. And, um, and then I had to let it go and let us all have her as our Josie. One of the most spectacular things I thought Josie did, and I witnessed this at the, you know, the uh, last 10 years that she was here, is the way in which she would be with people at the end of their lives. That she had no fear. And that she would be with somebody who needed her when they needed her and walk with them to the end of their lives. And to see the way in which those angels surrounded her these last few years was, of course, she paid it forward and it was owed to her and it was so beautiful. She was a role model for us, or for me, certainly in that way. When I came in 1991 to interview, I was coming from New York, and I tell you, the South was a foreign country. <laughs> what was I doing? In fact, they asked me in the interview, why are you applying to a school in the South? And I said, because you have a job. You know? <laughs> but the person who picked me up at the airport was Josie. The person who took me out to lunch was Josie. And because she was so truthful and so authentic and so funny, I thought, this could be my friend. And you know, she was. She was my really, really good friend. When she retired, which we think was in 2002, we can't quite exactly remember. <laughs> it was 
hard. It was hard on us. I wasn't ready for that then either. But I have to tell you, the building wasn't ready for that. Because on the day she walked out, her last day of being a full professor, to tell you the truth, the building burst into flames. <laughs> this is actual. <laughs> I mean, it was Doug Ritchie's office. <laughs> Next to Josie's, and some said it was electrical. <laughs> but my feeling was the building was really upset with the rest of us. <laughs> I got to be with Josie in September. She was in the hospital, and I spent some hours with her while you know we waited for tests to be done, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And for a couple of hours each day that I was there, we laughed and we joked, and it was, and I didn't always know what we were talking about, and it didn't matter one iota. Although she kept saying over and over to me, Holly, you gotta fix Act Two. <laughs> and then I'm not even directed. <laughs> so I have to say, I've been pondering that for a while. <laughs> but she found out in that visit how sick she was. And when she found that out, she took a beat, and then she said, well, we better get this party started. <laughs> and so let's do that. I have a couple things. If all of you have not had a chance to go into the studio theater and see the Josie memorabilia and select something for yourself, please take a moment to do that. And now I'd like to introduce Dean Ranta. Dean of our college, and I'm sure all of you know Dean. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was born here. <laughs> and it seems like Josie never really did retire. I mean, she was always here, even when she wasn't here. In fact, I'm pretty sure I came before she did, but I wouldn't swear to her. So I think her presence was here before I even arrived. So it was one of those things. But it was great having her as a colleague and professor in the college. And I was uh, thinking back on you know times together and the magical way in which she did things. Uh, this was not an authoritarian person, although she could be, but in magical sorts of ways. And it kind of reminded me last night of her because uh, I was with my wife at a, a, a party at the Ridgeway, the Malco Theater in East uh, Memphis, and it was the 100th anniversary of the Malco Theaters, and uh, I think actually a couple of you in the audience were there. And there were various films around to choose to see after the drinking, eating, and things like that in the lobby, uh, preceded by a film tribute to uh, the Malco and, and the the Lightman family and Tashies and that. And my wife and I chose, for no particular reason, The Wizard of Oz to go and sit in and see the pre-film and the film. We weren't necessarily planning on staying, but we did. And it was one of those sort of magical things. And in the midst of that, I sort of mixed up Josie and the Wizard. <laughs> or maybe it was, you know, the good fairy or, or uh, witch. I hate using the term wish with Josie, but you know, she, she was such an amazing person the way that she would, you know, use humor, laughter, that from up high, you know, look uh, at you to get things done. Or just wandering into my office and going, is this Dean this sin? You know, it's, it's rather disarming. <laughs> and usually whatever she wanted. Uh, that's the way it worked. But, I think one of the memories that, that I will always carry away is something that I was able to do with her. I, I've been doing a, well, television shows of various kinds for many years, but one of them for over three decades, the Grammys, and I've been working on that show in one capacity or the other for all that time. One of the years when Josie was on a <coughs> supposed sabbatical out working on something out on the West Coast, I had the great privilege and honor to have her as my guest at the Grammys, and there's no question, when she floated in that red balloon and the spectacular dress she had, which kind of which she was. She was the Wizard of Oz and okay. just a beauty. I got my boots on. <laughs> <laughs> 
because that's my first memory of Josie. But she made lots of actors or cult helped cultivate lots of actors, but she also helped cultivate lots of drama teachers. And with that, lots of warm-ups started here that go on to our students that someday will come back to us tenfold. So stand as you are able. We're going to do a little warm-up. I'm Jenny Madden, Odell Madden. I graduated in 1992. <laughs> I think I have the distinct pleasure to introduce to you someone who is very special and we are so thrilled that he is with us today representing Josie's family. <coughs> Jeffrey Kalanick has now become my friend and I am happy to introduce you to him as he stands before you to represent his mother, Josie's big sister, Aureen, as well as his wife, Grace, and their two children, Gavin and Ginger. Please welcome Jeff from California. Well, uh, I'm very glad to be here. So, uh, my name is Jeffrey. Helming Palinic, and uh, I was Josie's favorite <laughs> so, nephew. Uh, I'm the only child of her sister, Aureen Helming Palinic, uh, so I didn't really have a lot of competition. Um, so I am going to get through this. My parents uh, were divorced when I was in 1975, and we moved from Long Island um, in 1980 down to Memphis. And before this, I had met Josie uh, on a few occasions when she would come and visit and bring lots of real presents. <laughs> so she already had a good reputation with me. Uh, when we arrived in Memphis for a short time, we stayed with Josie and her cat, Sibel, on the uh, in her apartment on McLean and Poplar. And uh, Josie and Sheila Bam taught me to play backgammon. And the Judys, Powell and Moore, taught me to make stained glass. And this was my first introduction to Judy's, or to Josie's world. And uh, in the summer of 1980, I became an honorary red balloon player. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the warm-ups were very familiar, although I haven't done them in 30 years. Um, I went to rehearsals and worked on set painting and traveled to the Memphis Parks circuit to watch the players do their thing. It seems like I spent half my life shuttling between Memphis State and the theater department here and Playhouse on the Square before it became um, University of Memphis. <laughs> So by the time I was 12, I had already seen more theater than many people see in their whole lives. And thankfully, I did not get the disease, <laughs> despite the exposure. <laughs> I did, however, go to art school, and uh, Josie had a hand in that, actually, as well. So I was ever the procrastinator, and Josie dragged me into the faculty room and sat with me, and she graded her papers while I filled out application, appli you know, the applications for college. And she wouldn't do it for me, of course, but she was there for moral support and to make sure I did not abandon my task. <laughs> In every way, Josie was another mother for me growing up. Uh, 
I grew up in a single parent household and Josie became the other parent who listened to me and steered me in the right direction without bias or pandering. And I think her experience as a college professor treating theater students, I mean, teaching theater students, <laughs> <laughs> made her uniquely qualified to help me through adolescence. Uh, she was also a great source of moral support to my mother, who was doing double duty as a single parent. Jo uh, Josie was generous in everything. Uh, Christmas and birthdays were always fun, and she loved to have a good time and give lots of presents. From early childhood all the way through adulthood, she always gave me children's picture books. And I think this was partly because of the illustrations. Um, but also because Josie wanted to remind me not to take myself so seriously. She's the one who taught me all about Shel Silverstein. Yeah. To know Josie was to know that she was not afraid of children. And if you were a child, you would be spoken to with the same regard as any adult in the room, and perhaps even with some preference. <laughs> I'm very grateful that my children had a chance to learn this about her as well. A healthy share of my parenting comes from that experience, and I'm often reminded of her when I sing with my daughter or play the wag with my son. Uh, Josie's mother was a college-educated, uh, rare at that time, uh, as well as her aunt, who was a health commissioner for the state of New York. So she came from a legacy of women and men who thought for themselves, and it showed in her life. Josie loved to fool around, but she didn't suffer fools. <laughs> One of the many in favorite growing up stories that were shared around the dinner table was the story of the pink plate. There was a set of multicolored plates, one of which was pink. Both of the girls coveted this plate and fought almost every night over whose turn it would be to have the pink plate for dinner. <laughs> Their parents had spoken to them numerous times trying to work out a way for them to share and uh, but it was to no avail. Until one night when their father had had quite enough and while they were still bickering without a word, he picked up the pink plate from the table and made a short journey to the concrete balcony <laughs> and proceeded to drop the plate for its final setting. <laughs> At which point the fighting stopped <laughs> and the two girls stared in quiet amazement, and their father came to sit down at the table for dinner and not another word was said about the pink plate. <laughs> I think that says something about Josie. Um, a couple of years ago I learned that Josie's memory was beginning to deteriorate and I made a long overdue journey back to Memphis to help her sort some things out. I felt somewhat helpless being in California. I knew that I couldn't do much for her, but I knew that she had another family that was taking care of her, and that was you. Just like me, Josie had served you and cared for you and loved you, and you responded when the time came to love her back. As many of you know, Josie died with the same grace and attitude as she lived. She was always cheerful when she wasn't completely exhausted, and she was always thoughtful of those around her. She comforted us in her passing as much as we comforted her. She thought of everything. <laughs> Josie was a big person, and she filled a big part of our lives. And though she's gone, she did not leave it empty. She left us with many gifts that we will carry with us for the rest of our lives. 
And that's everything that I had to say. Um, but I asked my mother, who couldn't be here, to also write, because I know that all of you would want to know a little bit more about Josie um, and how she grew up. So this is from my mother, Aurene Helmut Palenik. And um, she's a better writer than I am. <laughs> uh, OK, so imagine this is her speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Josie and I were born in Minneapolis to a family of Midwesterners. When Josie was four and I was seven, the family moved east to Mamaroneck, a suburb of New York City. Our father was an editor at Houghton Mifflin Publishing and commuted to the city. Our mother was a housewife, artistic and civic-minded. They were good-natured, caring young parents. Joe and I shared a bedroom growing up where we spent happy hours listening to radio programs like The Lone Ranger and Inner Sanctum and shared other activities like jumping on our beds, <laughs> the wooden frames of which our father had to repair more than once. And of course, arguing about where the line was between her side of the room and my side of the room. We also liked to sing, especially after lights out. The songs were ones we learned at school and at Girl Scout camp. Our parents often despaired of quieting us, and I can still see one or, one or other of them at our bedroom door demanding or imploring us to be quiet and go to sleep. After all, there's only so much Stephen Foster and rounds of white coral bells a person can stand. <laughs> I'll tell you something else about that bedroom door. It was located near the front door of the apartment, and when we were a few years older, one night as my date and I were leaving, after he had come in and said hello to my parents, I noticed the bedroom door was ajar and automatically went to pull it closed, but it was stuck. Not so stuck, however, that it didn't wobble a little, because my little sister was holding it open so she could peek. <laughs> it's hard to think of Josie as a little sister. <laughs> Since we were three years apart, we didn't run in the same circles while we were growing up, and our interests were different. Josie liked to read movie magazines, and so I could never understand why our intellectually-minded parents kept buying her movie magazines, of all things. <laughs> Obviously, they knew something I did not. She and I both went to the University of Florida, and she was into theater from the beginning. During most of our young and middle adult years, we lived different lives in different places, visiting back and forth from time to time. She stayed with me while in New York City. I remember Taylor Brooks and Tim Myers and Ken Friedman were there then, among others some of you would know, I'm sure. Fast forward from the 1960s to the 1980s. Jeff and I moved to Memphis when he was in fourth grade, and the three of us became more of a family unit. She became his go-to Aunt Josie. Her house was his home away from home. When things would come to a head between Jeff and me and all else failed, I might say, call your Aunt Josie. And I could overhear him on the phone with her, and then she said, and it's not fair, <laughs> and so forth. Actually, I made a point of not listening. They made quite a team sometimes. They didn't gang up on me exactly, but they did see eye to eye on some things. For example, from time to time, an episode like fo the following would occur. Because despite my appreciation of social amenities, I would occasionally lapse. So we would all be walking in a crowd, such as at the mall, or a theater, intermission, or an airport, and I would be turning to watch a person or persons, oblivious and not conscious of staring, unquestionably bad manners. I might have noticed a parent giving a little kid a swat that seemed unjust, or a young woman wearing just about nothing, or wearing something spectacularly wonderful. Suddenly from behind I would hear quiet, urgent voices simultaneously saying, Mom! Or, and Aureen and Josie, sort of smiling, would say, you were staring. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, Josie was probably the most generous spirit most of us will ever know. She was always supportive of my efforts, and she was, as she was of the efforts of many of you, 
A while back, I came upon this note from her that she wrote me almost 20 years ago. I don't remember the situation, but here's what she wrote. This is me telling you that your perseverance is commendable and will pay off. Please rise above or sink below and let it go over your head. <laughs> Any temporary obstacles. If $1,000 would help you going forward, then you've got it in cash right now. Please know that you're a great asset, a no-risk investment, and I'd like to make it. Cheers and love, Josie. And as many of you also know, she loved to give presents and to receive them too, of course. In our little family, Christmas and birthdays were the ultimate times. For her, the more the merrier. Spoiled rotten by her we were. As the years went by, I tried to be firm about what she and I gave each other, emphasizing that we needed to be paring down, not continuing to accumulate. Gifts were fine, I preached, but they should be consumable, practical, or with a limited <laughs> lifetime. <laughs> no more trinkets, large or small. It was a concept she approved of, but found difficult to follow to the left. <laughs> she became inventive. Pears from Harry and David, pedophores from somebody else, gift packages of spices and herbs from Penzies, top of the line gardening kitcheny gloves, Califon pans, padded socks worthy of a marathon runner, down comforter and many more, and then maybe a pair of earrings with a not very apologetic comment. I know you don't want any more things, but when I saw these I couldn't resist. And there's something to wear after all. That's practical. <laughs> <laughs> Josie liked tradition. Thanksgiving and Christmas meant turkey and mashed potatoes and gravy and rutabaga. <laughs> <laughs> and stuffing. Her nephew loved her stuffing. When she was on sabbatical in California, she FedExed a package of her stuffing to Jeff for Thanksgiving. <laughs> After Jeff was busy with his own life, Josie and I established a new Sunday evening routine. First supper, then Murder, She Wrote, and then Scrabble. <laughs> Joe was good friends with John and Jerry Dye's mother, Lynn, who was a competitive game player. She and Josie would play Scrabble and Lynn's version of Gin Rummy when Josie visited the Dyes. And then Josie, who professed to play just for the fun of it, <laughs> but Primed would come and beat the pants off me at the game. She always managed, it, managed to collect a lot of face cards. She whistled under her breath when she played gin, especially just before she reached out and swept up a bunch of cards to make a <coughs> killing. Scrabble was my game, so I got some good wins there. Sometimes during our games, a phrase would trigger us, and we would break into song, just as we had when we were girls. This, that was... <laughs> ongoing throughout my life. <laughs> um, we used to kid that we knew the first lines or verses of lots of songs. She knew many more than I did, and also she could harmonize. At Christmas, of course, we were good for the first verses of most carols and excellent at humming along. <laughs> Josie was a happy, giving spirit. When she wasn't buying a little treasure to give somebody, she was choosing a beautiful greeting card to send. My drawers and books and inside cupboard doors all hold lovely cards. I couldn't bear to throw away. And they're all signed, Cheers and Love, Josie. And that's what she left us. Cheers and love. Thank you. Well, I have to say, this has been so much fun. As I kept on saying to people, they would say, oh, I haven't said a plan, I wanted to start. I can't remember. I'm all in preparation for it. But it has been such a treat to see all the folks that came here and how they just are doing so great. It would all be nice stuff. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
remember the first day that I met you and I walked into the office and I had been here before but you were on sabbatical so I didn't know who you were until that time and I came in you were in your fuzzy brown jacket and uh, and you proceeded to save my life for like an entire day <laughs> to get me into school and to find a way to pay for it and all of that stuff and uh, and now I am a, a, a fuller better person for it you saved my life too because if you hadn't done that for her then she wouldn't be here right now and she would have gone back to Massachusetts. So thank you. Okay. I'm taking this faculty in the fall of 1965 involved this very tall lady who was doing a more convincing cowboy. <laughs> My life story. And I was talking to her because I figured out quickly that she had done a lot of theater in her life. And so I asked her, what was I going to do if there was no male narrator? And she couldn't have had that. She could do this for No, no, what I said actually wasn't me. I just said, well, why does it have to be a male? And then you were, I'm a grad student this first year. And so what I also remember are her silly shenanigans. And she's up here, like hitting the balls and all. And then you have a little chair chases to this one's reason for the chair. And sitting in her chair and you put it But you can go on the top. That's right, because just in this middle school year, there was my we were I started teaching her at 22. And then Josie left for 10 years, and then no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we worked out. Yeah, but I wanted her to come to look at the job. I think we made the final decision by doing tarot card reading. <laughs> 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 That's the best. You've heard the story, I suspect, of a dumb version of that story. <laughs> John McNair, the two people all the time that voted against Josie when she and so we had a role for this out there and we were really concerned and it's really the more right all along. <laughs> Before I actually met you, I hated you. I was jealous of you because I thought you were Keith's first love. <laughs> and when you came back to me, this is how you would take him away from me. And it could have if you wanted, but thank God. Josie, it's today, probably, and maybe tomorrow, marks uh, our 44th anniversary of me. At P.K. Young High School Auditorium in 1957, Gainesville, Florida. You were a slim, good looking young boy, an academic, a good major in history, I think. But many of the Florida players, me, you may recall, and you signed up to help out in the shop, and that's the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> We've been together ever since. It's a remarkable moment in the history of our theater, anyway. But she have been 25 years since she came back. I started in 26. I know, that's pretty fascinating. But of course, we're here all around, so I'm just doing remote players. Have you forgotten to talk about it? The dead man has. The dead man has. We did it in 1969. It was the first year of the draft of Garbage Strike. And we had an integrated company, went into the parks, where the park system was still really swell. It was interesting. Uh, and they were threatening another garbage strike, as I recall, when we were at the Jewish Community Center. And I called Ron and said, We're going to go into the parks. And he said, What are you doing? And I told him, He said, I don't think there'll be a problem. And every once in a while, I'd look up and there'd be somebody on a bike. You just hang around. And there was no problem. Flight we were actually these on, um, on the flights of the Cotton Carnival. We, we built sets at the Cotton Carnival barn. 
It's right as an important <laughs> song time in my repertoire. <laughs> 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 this is a I wish I was a fascinating bitch. I'd never be poor, I'd always be rich. I'd live in a house with a little red light. I sleep all day, I don't work all the night. And when it's so weak, I take a little rest and drive all our customers while I'm out. I wish I was a fascinating bitch instead of a legitimate child. You make me happy when it's gone away. You'll never know, dear, how I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. <laughs> This is the at Cunningham Theater in Dallas. Um, with Josie is still being teaching her most famous course that we wrote. I that works out. Tabby Jesus. That dead Russian guy. It's great. If anyone's ever been able to take it until they finish it, then they go, well. well. Thank you for all the time. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. To this day, I've been asking to remember some of the stuff that she said. So she had me run around with big bread about 50 times until I was out of breath. And then she made us lay down and laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh until we just found ourselves crying our little eyes out. And it's a little skill that she taught me. I, I use it all the time now in my sales career. <laughs> <laughs> and it closes deals. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. Uh, Jesse and Marie. Well, I was always told by our very good friend Sam Jordan that I would always be Josie when I grew up. And I always went, no, I'm not. I'm not going to be like Josie. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. And guess what? I'm <laughs> just like you. <laughs> and that is a very wonderful compliment. Josie, I had my teeth cleaned just for this occasion. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to thank you for your acting class at the age of today. Class schedule if you promise only to make seats the entire time you're here. I was the kind of person who had to have perfection or I just gave up entirely. And she wasn't going to go for that. She was, she was very, very right about that. Thanks a lot for your laugh. It's a great laugh. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> No, because I remember as a freshman, my husband said Jenny was trying to get me into classes, but she only got me into Steve Mallon's um, intro class, and then she put me in the other class class, and she put me in a lab. And then Stephen Huff, who was taking directing experiments, asked me to be in the scene. And I said, oh, but that's during my English class. And he was like, oh, okay, well, I'll just give it just one time, and I'll be in here singing. <laughs> and I never went back to England. <laughs> <laughs> she just used to yell at me. I like to do that. I don't know. Yes, you do. <laughs> I didn't do my journal entries. <laughs> oh, this journal, I found a great job in that mind. But it was like I just couldn't do it. I thought you were like practicing psychology. <laughs> They were trying to be inside of my head, which at the time I was very protective of. But as you say, my general didn't get over what I see, you know, without that journal. And we all know what I never did. I read it by Josie, and I wouldn't miss it for the world all 12 years. I was <laughs> undergrad. It's Jesse with Sons. You have the record. Okay, I'll tell one story from over here. I'll just be close to our camera. Yes. Okay. My favorite movie of the two of you to go. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> it was a cat party for when we did uh, one star and Marjorie Bourbon and the other one. And we had Cliff and I at our apartment. We had five of them chili party. Oh god. That everybody should have had. And you, maybe we should have had. My favorite image is Gloria was reclined in our recliner with a 
standing all the way back. And I remember she looked up to me and she said, Ron, you have any more whale music? And it was dawn, I thought it was past dawn, and I was telling Josie, I said, Josie, come on, make sure you don't get a throw a blanket over to make sure she gets up. Josie will play until Gloria has left. And I remember walking out, and it was like 9, 10 o'clock in the morning. She was amazing. And she said, we have this opening at the university. Could you come in just for a whole year? <laughs> and uh, Gil and uh, Toby find somebody. And uh, it was an opening in the movement theater. And I came here for just one year. And here I am, 20 years later. <laughs> so thank you, Josie. You helped me find my place in the world. Thanks for your humor. Uh, three friends, right? Your, your love about building things and your sensitivity and your humor. And I have your time. Josie, I have my thoughts together because I'm a good stage manager and no one else will ever understand this, but I just want you to know I have the cranes and I will never forget a crane life and how many cranes you folded during that rehearsal process. I love you. You're one of the most important people in my life and you're awesome. Congratulations on your time. And Josie, for you, I just want to tell you that you were wonderful at pushing me and everyone else in your classes and around you to be the best that they could be. And I was very happy to have gotten to know you and have been able to inspire you. Hi, I'm Josie. Um, I'm a typical class with you. I feel like I've had a lifetime of classes. So that's a good advice you've given me. Hi, Josie! Thanks for taking care of all my books and scrapes and making sure I didn't fall out of the catalogs and holding my hand and putting my head full of all those wonderful things. Thank you very much. You've been an inspiration to so many students over the years and we'll miss you. Have a very happy retirement. I remember so much that you said to me, so much that you taught me. I still quote you to this day in every aspect of my life. But no, it was interesting to think about it. And as you can see, it makes me teary to even think of Josie now being here. It's hard for me to move together. She can say she'll be here doing this. Yes, I will. Know. But she's thinking to do the work. <laughs> so it's hard for me to imagine functioning. I think we've so grown together. But I think part of our department is about that we have become like almost perfect compliments of one another. Don't I think we each balance each other in a really incredible kind of way? Um, we'll just do it differently. <laughs> but it's going to be interesting to see the rest of the department, but I think it's created such a spirit in the other departments. That it probably has a history that goes on, but it's it's been it's a rare thing in modern America to have a working relationship this small. Do you, you know what I mean? Where people really do kind of create a world together. We created it the way we wanted it to. <laughs> It's great. So I'm glad that we, I do think that we do this way, galvanized you to think about going on. Well, you know, I, know, I guess maybe it did. I don't I didn't think of it in that way. <laughs> and also because I think it is time. I mean, I think it's probably time for some stuff to shift and change. And I, there are a lot of things that should perhaps happen, many of which I don't need to be aware of. And that's good. I mean, it's not bad. It's just a good thing to start. It is absolutely good, and I'm for it myself. <laughs> <laughs> just I just love that. I have to say, it's just been so much fun to watch me. You know, we were sisters in another world. You know, I'm not one of the good people in this meeting where I stand in their shoes. But um, I can never thank you enough for taking care of the homeless. There's not many professors that take us back and let us know when we enjoy guys who start as a freshman. And a huge part of my life from the time I was 13, you know, I was sitting on some bubble books and eating uh, cheesecake. And you've been my Aunt Josie, and you've been my teacher, and now you're my
my friend, and I love him very much. We uh, first met you in 1982. We came to uh, Universal Memphis in Memphis State at the time, and it was a uh, very unusual situation where our son was transferring here, and we were trying to find a place for him. And um, we found one other place for him. We found a person that was just uh, incredible. Josie. 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 We love her. She taught us stuff. But <laughs> <laughs> just how to act. Indeed. That way. And well. At the same time. <laughs> <laughs> we all got better later, and it all has to do with you. This is right. an early formative training when we weren't ready for it. But it sunk in. Somehow. Absolutely. Oh, really? Stick at it as we were at 18 and 19 and 20 and 21. Mm -hmm. thank so you. thank you. We love you, Justin. Thank you. Uh, I thank you for everything you've done. Most of all, Justin. I just thank you for being a friend. We love you. We love you here. And you'll always be a friend. God bless. And go forward with your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> I went to God and said, I'm afraid I try to lift stuff. And he said, I was afraid that people would be too big on the front my arm. I think the great pleasure for me this weekend is how many people are in the theater. I mean, I really want you to think it is like, I keep mean, thinking it's like really my favorite thing to do, but it doesn't, they keep telling me that it doesn't really make sense. But it's been a pleasure how many people are actually in the theater. I mean, we're doing stuff that are a lot of things theatrical. So it's exciting. Is there a drug? I don't want to be doing stuff. Well, I'm changing, carrying on. Oh, my God. Hi. Hey, Claire. Hey, where's the chair? I'm there. I'm there. Quote 
that is either from one of two equally important figures in the theater, Josie Helming or Anton Chekhov. <laughs> you are to, at any point, um, we, we're not going to give an order to things, so just stand, and if somebody else stood before you, then wait till they're finished, it doesn't matter. But you're going to stand, and you're going to say, for instance, drop your shoulders, and we're all going to answer... Josie! Or you'll say something about Russia. <laughs> and Alice, are you going first? Uh, no, but do say the Chekhov quote, say. Oh, yeah, well, they all say who, who said it or who didn't say it, so don't you say it. So that we can <laughs> and after we're finished, we will, um, uh, well, should, I don't know. I don't know what we'll do when we're finished, but we're going to play by air, and it's going to be great. <laughs> okay, um, so, and it, uh, and it's... Josie! Who else? What Mother Teresa does is important. This is acting. <laughs> <laughs> when a woman is playing, people say, what beautiful eyes you have, beautiful hair. Check out. I'm a seagull. No, that's not it. Check out. <laughs> Don't let them sit down. They'll never get them back. Check out. <laughs> Time wounds all heal. <laughs> <laughs> Not to decide is to decide. Jesse! You cannot play an emotion, I won't let you. Jesse! Peace and love. Peace and love. Jesse! And a thousand years from now, man will still be saying, ah, life is so hard, and will still, like now, be afraid of death and not want to die. Check, Check out. Out. Oh, how the music is played. Favorite thing we missed. What is love entirely forever? What is left alone to begin our life again? We must live. Check, Check off. off. It was a true love. It was artificial. But it seemed real enough at the time. Check, Check off. off. When you go down in flames, it's interesting. <laughs> Put the emphasis on the appropriate, appropriate syllable. <laughs> All right, let's stop. What? <laughs> 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 Next to being a man, it's better to be an ox, it's better to be a common horse, if only you do the work. <laughs> There's plenty to do if you want to do it. Choose <laughs> matter. Ask real question. Jealousy. Indeed. <laughs> This is not brain surgery. <laughs> okay. uh, this is a real question. You can say no. Stop <laughs> them if they can't take it down. <laughs> So far, all he's done is destroy it. Check, Check it off. off. Women can't forgive failure. Check <laughs> it off. <laughs> Time will pass, and we shall be for, we shall be gone forever. They will forget us, but our sufferings will turn into joy for those who will be living after us. Check, Check it off. off. If ever you should need my life, come and take it. Check, Check it off. off. Only God knows what our calling is. 
Your play is so hard to act. There are no live people in it. <laughs> <laughs> Just talk. Jersey. The floor is not your friend. Have you ever been to a rehearsal? No, that's why we call them rehearsal. Get your hair out of your eyes. People don't do things to you. You let people do things to you. <laughs> Say your words loud and don't fall the stage. And sing. <laughs> I'm Steve Swift, and I graduated with the BFA in performance in 1994. Um, I must say that video was incredible, so thanks to the um, And seeing um, Gloria and Josie together was just kind of really wonderful for me. Um, but it made me think of something. I wasn't going to say this, but Gloria may absolutely kill me. But I'm going to say this. <laughs> um, so, not this past summer, but the summer before, um, as everyone was working to kind of move Josie out of her condo, um, there were some things in Gloria City. Is there anything you know you might want to take to your office for Voices of the South and some things like that? And um, she was having people kind of combine. Is there some little thing you want? And so I, I happened upon this object and it caught my eye. It was kind of it looked like a deer antler kind of thing. <laughs> What is that? And without hesitation, um, Gloria said, Oh, um, that's Josie's roach clip. <laughs> and I said, Roach clip? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I, I didn't know. I was never really, I was never going to smoke pot, but there was one year <laughs> in, in the 1970s, baby, when Josie was really into pot for a little while. <laughs> I just remember thinking, Josie, what are you doing? Well, that's your roach clip. <laughs> it, has, it is one of my most prized <laughs> It is on a shelf in my living room, and it also hangs on my Christmas tree. <laughs> um, anyway, apologies, Gloria. I didn't mean to say that, but seeing the two of you together made me think of that, and I thought it was very funny. Uh, so, I'm, like I said, I'm Steve Swift. I graduated in 1994. Um, I moved here to attend uh, Memphis State University in the fall of 1987. And for those of you theater majors um, who can do math, that is seven and a half years. <laughs> I was an undecided major, uh, but I told my advisor uh, over in Skates Hall that I wanted to take intro to theater. That was the one thing I knew I wanted to take. And that first theater class um, introduced me to Doug Kirchie and a parade of jackets with rolled up sleeves. <laughs> and he never wore the same one twice. <laughs> um, it also brought me into this room um, where I um, saw Rosencrantz and Gilpin Sterner dead. Um, 
And over the next few years, I decided to major in international business <laughs> um, and in German <laughs> and then accounting <laughs> and then architecture <laughs> and then pre dentistry. <laughs> And all the while, through those years, I came here to this building um, uh, to see plays and quietly, qu like quietly witnessing what took place on these stages. Um, I also knew that there was one thing that was definitely going to stand in my way of graduating, and that was a class called public speaking. I knew I could never, ever stand in front of a group of people and speak. <laughs> um, and so finally, my advisor told me that there was actually a class I could take in lieu of public speaking, <laughs> and it was called um, Basic Oral Interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, I would only have to read poems, and it was a theater class. <laughs> um, that class introduced me to Gloria Baxter, and before I knew what had happened, <laughs> I was a theater major. <laughs> And I was in acting classes with a really tall woman who fed me oranges and apples um, and carried a long macrame keychain. And she said, fuck a lot. <laughs> in class, in front of students. <laughs> Um, as a new theater major, I was introduced to the great canon of theatrical literature. Um, Shakespeare, Chekhov, and of course, a Greater Tuna. <laughs> I loved it. I thought it was absolute and complete genius. Josie was not such a fan. Um, I kept saying, but they changed clothes real fast. Um, <laughs> How could you not see the genius? Uh, I wanted to do monologues from Greater Tuna in acting class. Um, I can see you like subtlety and nuance, she said. How about a David Mannett monologue? She encouraged me to reach further and dream bigger. Um, but I wondered how she couldn't see the genius in Bertha Bue Miller and Petey Fisk <laughs> and the citizens of Tuna, Texas. <laughs> Finally, Josie relented, and she set out to prove to me that the techniques that she taught in building relationships and finding the stakes would work, um, even in Greater Tuna. Um, she workshopped my hilarious Petey Fisk monologue <laughs> until it was bloody. <laughs> it felt like weeks before she would let me move on to something else. What was Petey's childhood like? What did Petey eat for breakfast? <laughs> did Petey come from a broken home? <laughs> Who gave a shit? I just, I, 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 <laughs> um, and then one day in the hallway, she said, I just want you to dig a little deeper. That's all. And then she went on and she said, I actually have really high hopes for you. And everything changed that day. I'm like, what? You know, she did? Me? Um, it was a simple comment. And it was just an aside um, to a student in the hallway one day. A student who felt a bit out of place um, in this place, um, but everything shifted. Josie thought I had potential. <clears throat> Ironically, after graduating, um, Jenny Odell um, was slated to direct Todd Berry and me in a production of Greater Tuna here in this space in Big Red during the summer, and I believe all funds were supposed to go to re-carpet in red. <laughs> New red carpeting. Um, and for some reason, I can't even remember why, but it ended up that Jenny couldn't direct and Josie was in town that summer. And so Josie stepped in <laughs> and, and directed me and Todd in a production, the worst production <laughs> of Greater Tuna that has ever been seen. <laughs> In fact, 
Um, if Emory Hall is here today, <laughs> I seem to recall her in particular gushing about how wretched that show was. <laughs> In a grocery store one time or something. <laughs> yes. Um, so today I can honestly say that I have finally had my fill of tuna. <laughs> um, after graduating, I would house sit for Josie uh, during the summer and um, sometimes when she was on sabbatical. And there was about three years where I really didn't have a home. I alternated between Gloria's house, Susan Kritzberg's house, and Josie's house for three solid years. Um, and sometimes Josie would come back into town and she'd say, oh, you don't need to find another place to stay, just stay here. And she would cook healthy things for me, sweet potato stew and things with five ingredients or less. That was her <laughs> um, And we would watch horrible television together. Um, she just like ju enjoyed junk television, um, and then she would make me go for walks. <laughs> um, but through the, throughout the years, um, I got to perform in five shows that Josie directed. Um, but in my final semester here, before leaving to spend a semester abroad in London, um, Josie cast me as the lead. Um, and I hadn't ever done like a lead role before. She cast me as a lead in a, a new play called Flood Watch, um, which was written by her dear friend, um, New York playwright Jan Buttram, who was in residence here while we rehearsed. Um, nearly 20 years later, I posted a YouTube video that went a little viral, and suddenly I was being contacted by distant relatives and people I went to high school with saying, um, are you on the internet? Um, and are you wearing a dress? Like, are you like an old lady who's like bitching about fall panties? Um, and so by chance, Jan Buttram saw the video in New York City. Um, we reconnected and she brought me and my dragon pony show um, to New York City in 2010 for a summer run at her Abingdon Theater. And so that's the way Josie worked in many of our lives, you know, connecting people, bringing people together that she thought, for whatever reasons, should know each other, even though we might not know until many years later why that happened, you know, or whatever. You're going to New York? Oh, well, you should meet Stephen Tom, you know? Um, Josie was the switchboard through which many of the people <coughs> in this room connected. Um, and I think if we work hard enough, um, we can keep up that legacy of connection to one another. Um, Jan Buttram would have been here today, uh, but she is in New Zealand. And so she asked me to read this. So this is Jan. Um, the legend of Josie Helming preceded her. Second mother to Taylor Brooks, Tim Myers, and Kenny Bonifons, Josie shepherded three of my best pals through their formative years, college and their startup years at Missouri's infamous Arrow Rock Theater. I pitched in with these young men in New Orleans and New York City. They introduced me to Josie. Our chance encounters grew into friendship when I began writing plays somewhere around 1985, and our friendship evolved into a mentorship. Josie was a cheerleader for new playwrights. If an actor had the slightest inkling toward writing plays, Josie believed, go for it. The depth of her theatrical knowledge and experience gave her a platform to guide me through many scripts. What do your characters want? What action and or choice are they willing to make to get it? What are the obstacles to getting what they want? She took a chance on this ever emerging playwright in 1993 and fully staged an early script of mine called Flood Watch on Memphis State University's main stage. It was a sad and funny play about the AIDS epidemic. <clears throat> Josie funneled what seemed like a small fortune from her university budget to me, brought me down from New York, um, housed me in her comfy front bedroom, cooked for me, gave me access to rehearsals and talented actors. Uh, this <clears throat> invaluable learning experience gave me a concept of who Jan Buttram would evolve into, a playwright, actress, and a theater producer of new American plays. She gave us all confidence. Confidence is a valued commodity in any career, but it's the big must-have in theater. 
I was lucky to have her direct two of my plays, and she read and commented on them all. <laughs> Watching Josie direct was a pleasure. She strolled across the stage, never hurried, but thoughtfully, leisurely, relishing every second of her journey. Patient, kind, and gentle, she could tease, cajole, and explore the irony of the moment. She wasn't mean, nor did she complain. I beefed plenty over the years, and she would defend my position to the end. I was right. She never cautioned me to tamp down my expectations, nor suggest that I throw in my theatrical towel. If I failed on paper, I always succeeded in her eyes. She introduced me to you, her beloved Memphis community. Our conversations covered plays she was directing, who her actors and designers were, and most important, what fun it was. Josie loved talking theater. Our Saturday morning chats were truly talkabouts. <laughs> she shared her talented students, Steve, Jerry, Stephen, Tom, Mary. So many of you continue to inspire me. My day job is artistic director of Abingdon Theater Company. One of my all-time producing triumphs was in bringing Sister Myotis' Bible Camp to New York City. What fun. Um, I invited Josie to teach a checkoff workshop for the Abingdon Posse. Her sessions were loving, erudite, and inspiring. The initially skeptic, know-it-all prose in New York City became putty in her hands. Not only was she generous and affectionate to me, but to my immediate family. Josie introduced me to the amazing Kathy Sawyer, who later agreed to marry my talented and handsome brother, Joe. <laughs> she gave my niece and nephew a place to crash when they were sorting out their paths. On the downside, she snored. <laughs> she told me she snored. We slept in the same room several times, and if I were there, I would recreate her snore. Steve, if you can give me something like a snore here. No, I won't. <laughs> Finally, I bought earplugs. But it was worth every sleepless night just to be near her. I've always been a greedy kid. I love getting presents. Josie sent me Christmas presents, birthday presents. This made me think of you presents. Even in my cramped apartment, I couldn't part with a one. She gave me her hand-me-down blue jean jacket, tied on her, loose on me. I wear it every spring. She gave me books, music, and was a loyal supporter of Abingdon Theater Company. So generous. My condolences to Orion and Jeff and to all of you here. Josie and I spoke about a month before she went on. Uh, she knew she was protected. And I was so touched and grateful for the loving care surrounding her. Thank you, Judy, Tiffany, and her incredible team of caregivers. You are her greatest reward. In honor of Josie, I vow to continue to walk in her loving theatrical footprints, squeezing every bit of juice from this crazy patchwork quilt of life. I'm grateful I knew her and that she loved me. May good health, full houses, and dynamite reviews come to you and yours in loving memory. challenging times, some people go out for beer and toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> and then some of us, chicken soup for the Irish. <laughs> A little friend said to me this morning, if you Squeeze your guts in. Really, 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 really hard. And you might not cry. I said, Are you sure? 
<laughs> and they said, <coughs> pretty sure. Okay. But I'm not making any promises. <laughs> the irrepressible soul always shines through. That's a quote I read last week. And this room is a lit, is it not? It is a glow. There are so many stories. It's overwhelming. There are, just, there are too many stories. So I'm just going to share one. I'm going to share the first one. <coughs> when I was four years old, we lived in Florida. And Daddy was in graduate school. And we didn't have any money. And so we would often take a drive to the ocean and spend the entire day. I remember at once being mesmerized by the sea and at the same time very afraid of it. I wasn't so sure that I wanted to get too close to anything so vast and seemingly unknowable. At the same time, I couldn't look away. I wanted so much to go into the waves and feel them break right through me, but I didn't dare. And then one day, while in the care of a certain babysitter, <laughs> who carefully put me atop her shoulders, way, 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 <laughs> and gently grasping my ankles while I held on dearly, strode lengthily into that pounding surf, reassuring me all the while until we reached that perfect spot where we could ride the waves but also get right back to shore. <laughs> you know, that safe place. <clears throat> we looked out into the horizon, gently bobbed up and down, <laughs> laughing at the diving pelicans who took their coolness oh so seriously. <laughs> We tasted the salt from our chins and, see, she said, everything is okay. She taught me not to be afraid of things that are too big to understand. <coughs> she taught me to take risks and in the doing so, everything would open up and I would see clearly and maybe even get to ride some waves. She taught me to trust. And for the rest of my life, time and time and time again, I was lifted up onto those sturdy shoulders of hers and carried to that safe place where we both looked out into the unknowable and at the wonder of it all, and it was okay. So as we stand in this warm and shining light of hers, I raise my glass. Her wings of love never lost a feather and her pillow of dreams was often visited by the gods. Joanna Parker Home. Thank <laughs> you.
Right? Uh, and and um, we need to be like, uh, with children, you know, I don't sing. <laughs> There's nothing to do that, too, so. Um, I would like everyone to sing loud. So it's loud, it's quiet, it's virtually silent with the motions, but the fire at the very end should overtake us all. We're going to be yelling fire in a theater, so just. Ready? Yes. One dark night when we were all in bed. This is only what the legend in the shed. When the cow kicked it over, she winked her eye and said, There'll be a hot time, little time tonight. Fire, fire, fire! One dark night when we were all in bed. This is only what the legend in the shed. When the cow kicked it over, she winked her eye and said, There'll be a hot time, little time tonight. Fire, fire, fire! And so now we're we're just going to take the party backstage. I'm um, here to, to um, this is our party where we mingle and, and talk about our um, stories, our memories of Joseph. Uh, we will be having a toast in your program. It mentions um, that Ren will be doing our first toast. Ren, unfortunately, is in school this morning and is not here. Um, I would like to add a note from on the call board. We're going to ask you to check, Donna. Oh, uh, I know from on the call board. There are people who would uh, might like to have a say today, and the toast is the time for you to do that. Um, and so please join us backstage. Woohoo! Woo What's the